Thanks so much for talking to me today. Oh, great. Well, Matt, it's an honor to be with you. Um, so you've been here six months now, around about. Yep. Yeah. Uh, have you managed to see much of Australia in that time? Oh, we, I love Australia. I've gotten to go to all of the capitals, both the state and territorial capitals uh, all around the country. Uh, and I've also gotten to see some other parts of the country along the way, like Uluru, uh, which was really amazing. Uh, it, it was a little warm when we were there. <laughs> and uh, uh, I've gotten to also go to Kangaroo Island and the Whitsundays. Uh, so it's, it's an amazing country with so many uh, beautiful things to see. But the, the, the best secret to Australia is the wonderful people. Oh, good. Good. Any yeah. surprises? What's been the biggest surprise that you found? Uh, no surprises. Uh, you, you know, uh, I learned about Australia from my dad, uh, who came here after uh, the Battle of Guadalcanal during World War II. And uh, he had been uh, with the Marines First Division on that island for about uh, over, over six months. And it was a pretty tough time. And when they finally relieved them and uh, they were allowed a f some time off, uh, they came to the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And my father said at the time that the Australian people were the warmest and friendliest and most good-natured, good-hearted folks he'd ever met. That it uh, not only reminded them uh, that there was good left in the world, but it was damn well worth fighting for. Wow. And, uh, and uh, so uh, my dad, until the day he died, whenever he heard an Australian accent, he would jump up and buy him a beer, <laughs> or at least offer. <laughs> oh, amazing. So, uh, you know, and it's also interesting to note that to this day, you know, when, when the first division pulled into Melbourne, the band struck up Walsing Matilda. And the sound of it, they said the general in charge in the history books say it was the sweetest sound any of them had ever heard. And to this day, the first division of our Marine Corps, whenever they ship out anywhere in the world, they ship out to the strains of Waltzing Matilda. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's, it's a great connection. <laughs> and you're here with Curtis, your husband. Yes. You married him a short time ago. How yeah. How did it feel to marry him and what was your wedding like? Well, it was wonderful because, uh, you know, we had been uh, together, we've been partners for over 17 years. So it was a long engagement. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, we were very fortunate uh, in the United States. Uh, we've been wrestling with the topic of marriage for many years. And uh, I am very grateful to our Supreme Court, uh, to our president, uh, to uh, the, our Episcopal Church, to the District of Columbia, all who had to come together to make our wedding uh, possible. Uh, but when those stars aligned, uh, we were very honored uh, uh, to have our marriage at St. Margaret's Episcopal Church in Washington. And uh, Curtis, my partner, is from Hawaii. And the uh, Hawaii tradition uh, is to, uh, uh, for the, the married partners to wear a lei. And uh, his sister very sweetly sent us very fresh uh, fragrant lays from Hawaii, so everybody in the wedding party was uh, decked out in lays. Uh, made it a very special and and, and unique occasion in Washington D.C. Uh, and uh, it was wonderful. Uh, it meant more to me uh, than uh, than either of us expected because though we'd been together for 17 years, to have the community, to have our church community, to have our friends and our families together. Uh, to essentially bless and approve uh, our relationship uh, was an incredibly humbling and heart-moving experience, and it, it created a well of strength that we will both draw upon as long as we're alive. Oh, beautiful. It's been incredible to see Barack Obama back marriage equality and LGBTI rights uh, for, you know, and some great speeches he's done, and I think the world does take notice of that. Would you agree? Do you think that that message is getting out there? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we now in the United States, 22 of our 50 states uh, now provide for marriage equality. And uh, uh, my prediction is that number will continue to grow. Um, President Obama, I've been very honored to be part of his team from the very beginning and, uh, uh, and as an openly uh, gay man. Um, it's been a great honor to work with him and to, uh, to help him move the ball forward. Uh, he has done more in the United States for our LGBT community 
than every other president before him from George Washington uh, to the present day combined. Uh, in five years, uh, he has moved the ball forward than all the rest of his predecessors. So uh, uh, our community uh, is deeply appreciative of his leadership, uh, his commitment, and, uh, and the fact that he has successfully done it without, uh, without losing any yardage. <laughs> mm, true. That's very true. So. Um, but you've been in public service now for three decades. Yes, right? yes. And I mean, it must have been hard going at the start. Did you find it difficult to be openly gay starting out in Washington? Uh, well, as, as many people starting out, I started in the closet and uh, did not come out till a little bit later. I was 25 at the time. And uh, <clears throat> when uh, I came out, I was working for uh, Congressman Steny Hoyer, uh, who was uh, wonderfully accepting and, and very supportive uh, and who has really been not only one of the best bosses I've ever had, but also a second father and uh, a great guardian angel of, of, in my life. Um, and uh, he was wonderful. And uh, uh, he encouraged me, I remember at the time saying, you know, it, you know, and it was very empowering to be out and to be open because it allowed you uh, to know that uh, you could bring your best to the game and you didn't have to hide any portion of yourself uh, in the closet. And he said, you know, if, uh, if anybody ever has a problem with it, uh, you probably wouldn't want to be working for him anyway. And he was dead right. True. And uh, so I've been very fortunate in my career to uh, break a few glass ceilings as we've gone along. Uh, uh, I've been confirmed by our Senate, uh, United States Senate, three times now, uh, all unanimously. Uh, once when it was in the control of the Republican Party. So uh, it, it shows that uh, in each of those instances, uh, I think it has showed uh, that we can, we can be judged by how well we do the job and by nothing else. And, and that's ultimately the goal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a theme we're getting in Australia in recent weeks with so many sporting codes here signing commitments to block homophobia and uh, increase inclusion in the games. I wonder what your reaction is to that. Oh, it was, it was fantastic. And in fact, I wrote a personal letter, letter of thanks to each and every one of the commissioners who uh, supported uh, you know, the strong stance that they took in each of the different sports, whether it be in rugby or Australian rules football and, and soccer. Phenomenal uh, uh, leadership. And, uh, and uh, I thought it was an outstanding action uh, by the Australian community. And so uh, I sent a personal letter of thanks to each of them for their leadership on that issue. Oh, great. And, and we're proud also in the United States right now, just most recently, Michael Sam has Sam. been uh, the first openly gay individual who's been successfully drafted, and I think St. Louis is going to be very impressed with how well he's going to perform. Yeah, it was an amazing video of him with his partner getting the news. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting, and it shows that, uh, you know, each and every day, uh, you know, you continue to break those ceilings. Again, all of us have one objective, and that is to just be judged by how well we do the job. Yeah, bring our best to the game. Like and allow us to bring our best. That's, mm -hmm. that's the key. And on that theme, uh, this Saturday is the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. Uh, are you doing anything for it personally yourself? Well, I will be uh, participating in the AIDS vigil here in Canberra on Sunday evening uh, and very much looking forward to that. Uh, I've uh, been involved with that issue for uh, my lifetime, really. And... Uh, um, really look forward to participating this July to the AIDS conference in Melbourne. And uh, I believe that uh, we really have it within our grasp for the first time to achieve an AIDS-free generation. Uh, and uh, I, we hope from the United States that that's a goal that can be set for the entire conference this July. And, and, uh, and this, this Sunday evening with the vigil will kind of be the uh, the beginning of what we hope will be an international dialogue and focus on, on how we can roll back this terrible tragedy called AIDS. I know you've been touched by uh, HIV personally, haven't you? Uh, I'm not sure if many Australians know uh, about your, your partner. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, was with uh, my first partner, Tom Leishman. Uh, we were together for 10 years, and uh, on our second date, uh, 
Uh, this was back in 1985, and in fact, we didn't even use the term AIDS then. We called it, we didn't have a name for it. Uh, everyone in the community know what it was, <laughs> um, though, because people were dying. And uh, at the, our second date, Tom, uh, uh, who is a wonderful man, uh, uh, said, you know, look, I want to be upfront and honest. Uh, I have it. And if you don't want to deal with this, because at the time there was a lot of fear and hysteria, he says, you know, I'd understand, but I'd rather we separate now if that was the case. And, and I remember telling him, uh, well, that would be a damn silly reason not to fall in love with somebody. And uh, uh, I'm very grateful that we had the 10 years we did. Uh, um, Tom was, uh, a, 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 I was, I've been fortunate. You're lucky in life if you get one love, one true love in your life. Uh, God has been good to me and I've had two. And uh, Tom uh, was a phenomenal individual who I think gave me the self-confidence to pursue my career in government. Uh, he believed in me in a way no one else had uh, and uh, gave me the courage to be the man I am today. Um, uh, and uh, he passed away in my arms in 1996, in June. Um, and uh, it was a tough battle. Um, I was his primary caregiver for the last two years of his life, which were pretty tough. Um, but I've also been blessed uh, since to uh, have had the great years I've had with Curtis, and, uh, and like I say, to have been for God to give uh, two great loves in my life, uh, uh, I, I'm eternally grateful. It's a nice way to look at it. Um, how do we uh, end HIV, though, is the big question. Think, what do you think the keys are? Well, the first key is education. We've got to make sure the next generation uh, doesn't repeat the same mistakes. Uh, it, you know. Uh, it, is, it is a very chilling statistic that some of the younger people in our community are having uh, uh, an increased uh, uh, unsafe sex practices. And, uh, you know, I think there's a tendency to think, oh, this is licked, uh, it's, it's like treating a cold. Mm -hmm. It's not. This is a tough disease. The drug regimen take an amazing and terrible toll. I have many friends who are uh, HIV positive who still wrestle with uh, this, you do not want this disease. And we need to make sure this next generation doesn't play too easy or fast with it. It, it is a terrible and tough disease. We can beat it. Uh, we know how to beat it. Uh, we know what safe sex practices are. We need to make sure this next generation coming up you know, my, my nephew in the United States is a young man and, and he's LGBT. And, you know, every time I see him, I make sure I underscore, you know, all it takes is one unsafe incident to contract this disease, just one. Um, and we need to make sure that they understand and don't forget that. And uh, it's incumbent on every one of us who are a little older in the community, who've been to the funerals, who have been to this, the terrible parts of this disease, to uh, remind them not to repeat this. And, and that's why I focus on, you know, let's, let's put that positive goal of an age-free generation out there so that this generation uh, can, can have something that uh, mine did not. That'll be better. We're lucky to be hosting the conference in Melbourne later yeah, this year. I think it's going to be a great opportunity for Australia. And, and Australia and the United States have been wonderful partners uh, in, in the Global Fund, uh, which fights not only AIDS, but tuberculosis and malaria, which are two other terrible killers in, of the human race. Um, and together we are you know, putting the funds in necessary to make sure that we can, we can achieve that goal of having an AIDS-free generation. I've been surprised in recent months how much worse things are getting for uh, some gay and lesbian people in, in other countries, uh, places like Russia with the propaganda laws, uh, places like Uganda where uh, a raft of new laws have come in to uh, block homosexuality. Uh, I, I can't understand really why things might be getting worse in some places and so much better in other places. 
Well, uh, you know, Australia is, is, and the United States, our community has been very fortunate in that uh, we've been able to achieve advances in both of our countries that have allowed uh, us to enjoy safety uh, of, of life and limb uh, and advances in legal protections uh, uh, that are, are critically important. Um, and, and we're not there yet. We're, we're both still striving to, uh, as our president says in the United States, we're striving to still become a more perfect union. Uh, that being said, there, as you mentioned, there are places in the world <coughs> where people are not protected uh, in, the, in the most basic uh, of, of life and safety. And uh, uh, Russia and Uganda and Nigeria um, and, and in other countries in the world, uh, there is an increased uh, homophobia. Uh, that is, that where people fear for their lives, they fear for their safety, and and people are killed uh, on a on an all too sadly regular basis. And uh, I think it's incumbent that our communities and countries where we've been more fortunate have a special responsibility to be engaged uh, to hold up those beacons of light, so that. Uh, the people who suffer in those communities know that it does not have to be that way, uh, that we do not have to accept this, and that the world can fight homophobia. And that's why this uh, day, which uh, we call Idaho now, uh, uh, an international day against homophobia, is so important because we need to communicate to our brothers and sisters who are in less fortunate places that we have not forgotten them, that we stand together, that gay rights are human rights. And both the United States and Australia will stand to protect them uh, and to do what we can to advance the cause of human rights all around the world. Agreed and lovely to hear. Thanks so much for talking to me. Well, it's been a great honor to be with you and, uh, and my warmest wishes to everyone in the Australian community. I've been very fortunate to get to meet many as, as I travel. We, we try to always in each city uh, meet with leadership from the uh, LGBT uh, community and, and, uh, and it's been wonderful to meet so many wonderful leaders in, in all around the country from Perth to Sydney and, and from Darwin uh, down to Adelaide. Uh, uh, it's a country that has a great, uh, 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 a great benefit of super leadership. And uh, uh, it, it's nice to see that in, in the LGBT community here in Australia uh, and I look forward to working with him in my tenure here in Australia. Good, nice to hear it. Thank you so much. so much. Great, good to be with you.